Okay, so today we begin day one of three of neural networks. Um, again, I just want to remind you all that this order is slightly different from the order that is on your on canvas. So this is pretty much all of 40 and a little bit of 41. So maybe the order is kind of the same, but um, but yeah, this does go into a bit of topic 41, but I do think it is good to know. Um, today we'll just be like doing the foundations of neural network and then tomorrow I'll get into image classification. So just in case for those of you who are looking out for image classification, because I know that that is a project topic that will be tomorrow. Um, so with neural networks, um, I do again want to preface by saying that most first data science job out of boot camp, you won't be dealing with neural networks just because there is the assumption that if you're going to be very proficient in neural networks, you're also very, very proficient in all the ML algorithms that lead up to it. Um, also, because most junior data scientists or um, I guess your first data science jobs, those are usually more about interpretability. Um, those job roles are more focused around interpretability. And we'll see that neural networks are less interpretable. Um, yeah, so that's another reason why you might not be dealing with neural networks uh, at your first jobs. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to, you know, get into this now so that in the future, at your future jobs, you can um, use this material or focus on some of the more common ML algorithms. So it's up to you what you decide. If you want to discuss these options with me, happy to do so as well. Um, so in today's intro to neural networks, we're going to talk about perceptrons. Um, perceptron is basically the simplest form of a neural network. So we'll talk about that structure first before we build on it. Um, so yeah, it goes from regular perceptrons to multi-layer perceptrons, um, which are our neural networks. We'll get into backpropagation, which is basically um, gradient descent for neural networks. And then we will build our first neural network on Google Colab. And Google Colab, as I mentioned before, um, I don't know if I, actually I don't know if I mentioned that before, but Google Colab is basically an online notebook built by Google. Um, exactly the same as Jupyter Notebook is just run on the cloud, and you also have the option to use uh, some faster processors. And I'll uh, show you all how that works. Um, again, depending on time, we may or may not get to everything in this notebook. I think we should be able to. Um, but if we don't, um, I have made the material more flexible for myself as well. And we can always talk about further extensions during office hours next week. So yeah, as a really quick um, <laughs> meme to show to get into neural network, um, you'll basically see that neural networks are a lot more powerful than any of the things that we learned last phase. Um, but yeah, there are some cons in that they are less interpretable. Um, I just really wanted to show you all this resource. This is a cheat sheet, but I don't know who would use this cheat sheet. But this is this is basically all the different kinds of neural networks that exist. And I'm sure that there are more now. So this was only created like, um, like two, three years ago. Um, today, we're going to talk about perceptrons. Basically, the neural networks that we're going to talk about um, in the next couple of days Deep feed forward net networks are what we're going to get to by the end of today, hopefully. Um, other ones that you might see, if you're interested in time series or building neural networks off of time series data, what would be interesting to you would be recurrent neural networks and long short term memory neural networks. So these RNNs and LSTMs, these are things to look out for if you want to build on time series. Um, for autoencoders, um, autoencoders are kind of like what the uh, word embeddings we were doing with NLPR. So it basically makes encodings for whatever input data is. And then finally, let's see where it is, convolutional networks. So this is what we would be using tomorrow for, um, for image classification. And it looks scary now, but we'll get into it tomorrow. Uh, finally, just something else that's really interesting. GANs are something that are really, really interesting right now. If y'all are familiar with um, deep fakes or, you know, those like videos where they like make Obama say things that he's not said, those are actually created with GANs. Um, so yeah, those are, I feel like the hot topic right now. GANs, we won't get into, we won't get into GANs in this course, but some students have tried to build GANs. They're often like smaller GANs, but yeah, I'll talk about some of those examples, like, uh, probably on Thursday. <laughs> 
Oh, ish for mm -hmm. neural networks. Wouldn't if you're trying to predict with some kind of algorithm, wouldn't you always want to use one of these because they're stronger? But if you're trying to build something for like understanding what features are most relevant, would you use like some of the other algorithms we've talked about so far? That's fair. Um, because again, I had mentioned that like there is uh models for uh Pre predictions and also models for inference. So in a way, yeah, but also we'll see tomorrow that neural networks have an overfitting problem um, okay. just because it's so granular. Um, okay, but so yeah, not necessarily always the case. They won't always be like better than. Mm hmm. Because sometimes there's one meme that I wish I put in here, but it's like using a chainsaw to cut your steak is like when you're using a neural network for something that can be done with a simpler model. Okay. Um, and, okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I mean, for other reasons, neural networks are very, very computationally heavy and memory intensive as well. Um, so and also slower, you'll see like okay. we're going to have a data set later and training a neural network does take a lot more time just okay. because of all the components. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a good instinct. Um, yeah, so I mean, this right now doesn't mean anything to us, but hopefully we will start understanding. I honestly cannot tell you what these blue bubbles mean. The pink bubbles are sometimes a little confusing too. Uh, but yeah, the world of neural networks is massive. Um, and there's like a super famous neural network course that I will send the link out to uh, when we're in the capstone phase for those of you who want to deep dive into it. But yeah. None of this should mean anything right now. This is just like an introduction to, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen these images of like the circles and the lines and we'll get into that. All right. So before, again, before we get into some more, some applications of neural networks, uh, we can use neural networks for clustering, for pattern recognition. Uh, what we'll be doing is more for image recognition. You can do time series testing, as I mentioned or image generation or any data generation with again um, as well. So some of the limitations which I actually just mentioned is good for prediction, bad for inference, and also really computationally expensive. Um, so this is the new thing that I feel like um, I wanted to incorporate into my lessons. But thinking of logistic regression as a perceptron. So perceptron is again, the very most basic neural network and it actually works in a very very similar way as um logistic regression does. um yeah so this diagram looks a little intimidating at first because it has like you know the nodes and again each of these are nodes um each bubble is a node um and i don't know you have all of these new terms like bias activation function to output but this is actually exactly what we were doing with our logistic regression. Um, so here each, imagine this is a neural network that's already built out. So imagine this is an already trained um, logistic regression model. So each of these inputs, and again, this is just for one row of data. Each of these inputs represents one feature. So let's say we have our, what's the one that we were doing? Um, maybe we had our churn data set. And in the churn data set, we had like international plan. Um, we had, what was some others? Like call number of minutes, number of customer service calls. That's what each of these input bubbles are. And when we trained our logistic regression model, um, you get some coefficients. Now, when we're translating from logistic regression to a neural network, each of those coefficients are called weights, synonymous. So each input is going to be multiplied by some weight and then summed together, right? Logistic regression, as remember, is a linear model. So it's just going to be a linear combination of all our features. And then this thing that we have here, we have our bias um, that we sum together to create our entire logistic regression equation. You can even think of this as our uh, linear regression equation, right? The bias is like our intercept term or the, or the constant term. And so we just sum all of these together, um, pass it through the activation function. So activation function is another new term that we're gonna talk about later. 
But the activation function, if you remember for logistic regression, is that sigmoid function. Remember, we first started by fitting like a straight line through the log odds data, and then we transformed it into the S-shaped curve just so that all of our data points are, all of our outputs are between zero and one. Similar thing that's going on here. We're passing this sum through an activation function, in this case, the sigmoid for logistic regression, and then we end up with an output of um, zero or one. And if you remember, with the sigmoid output and also with logistic regression, it's often like a number between zero and one and you just round down or round up and you can adjust that threshold. So just to go over some of the points that I have here to reiterate, this is just for one row of data, each input is a different feature. These weights, let's just assume this has already been fit. They are determined through gradient descent, the bias as well, because that is our intercept term. So all these Bs and Ws already determined through gradient descent. Yeah, bias is our logic, logistic regression intercept term. This activation function is the sigmoid function that forces output values between zero and one. And then the output is our classification result. So in thinking about this diagram as a logistic regression, any questions or things that we want to clarify? Excuse me, Ish. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we use, um, for example, linear function instead of sigmoid function to have a, for example, regression output? That, yeah, we definitely can. Yeah, actually in, um, um, in regular linear regression, you, I believe you don't even have an activation function, right? It's just the sum of your, um, of your weighted inputs and your intercept term. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I think understanding that this is the flow of you know inputs to outputs will really help understand how a neural network works. Because a lot of people are like, oh, it's a black box, but technically it's not. You can really like pull them out. Um, but yeah, this is really how the data is flowing through a single neuron of a neural network or a perceptron. Um, later we'll see, um, oh, actually, let me just go through these points. So um, the perceptron algorithm is about learning the weights for inputs, so these weights and the bias, to draw a linear decision boundary that allows us to discriminate between two linearly separable classes. So if you remember, if you ever plotted a decision boundary for logistic regression, it is defined by some linear function. So the perceptron will take in your inputs, sum them up with weights, add a bias, apply some activation function to get your output between zero and one. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about different activation functions. But yeah, you can basically have, again, as Ali had um, alluded to, doesn't always have to be a sigmoid. In neural networks, it's actually almost never a sigmoid. Uh, we'll talk about some of these tomorrow. But some other activation functions, we'll actually see a couple later in when we implement our first neural network. Um, there's a tan H one, which is basically hyperbolic tan tangent. I forget what tan stands for. In, in, um, uh, you have the Rayleigh, which is actually the most popular one, which we'll also see later. And there are many more. So many perceptrons put together is what creates your neural network. So any questions about this perceptron structure? I think it's very, very important to understand this structure before we move on. Okay, all right. So this is just an example of a linear decision boundary. In two features, um, it's just a straight line across. So multi-layer perceptrons. So perceptrons are too linear, we must go deeper. And often, you know, the purpose of a neural network is to get nonlinear decision boundaries in a classification context. So you can see, maybe we can find a scenario where your data is split up like this. We want to be able to draw these nonlinear decision boundaries to separate our data much better, right? Like in logistic regression, again, the decision boundary is linear. In um, SVM, it's also linear. I mean, of course, if you use a kernel and all that, um, but yeah. So this diagram, which we'll get into a little bit more, is a bunch of perceptrons put together. Um, with this, each node, um, sorry, 
with this, we're basically looking at a three input neural network. So imagine our uh, data set just has three columns. So each of these nodes in what is called the hidden layer works exactly the same way as this perceptron up here. So you can sort of imagine, all right, we're going to train each of these separately, but they're actually being all trained at the same time. So each of our features is going to go into each of the nodes in our hidden bound in our hidden layer. You're going to have weights and biases for each node for each um, feature. So basically, you would have like three weights for um, for this node here that are going to be different for the three weights in each of the next nodes. Does that make sense? Is this kind of like a well, I don't know. It just reminds me of the random forest. Mm, kind of. Random forest is a goes top down, mm -hmm. uh, but this is sort of going all at once. Okay. Yeah. Um, Where like you yeah. have a bunch of different. I don't know, I guess like sub sets that have different like weights of features. I don't know. Yeah. So let me let me actually draw this out. I think this might help. So let's say for this feature X1. And remember X1 is a column. Um when this X1 goes into this first node, is going to have some weight one and then some bias one. So it's going to be some linear transformation that goes into there which is going to be different from, and again, this is the second feature going into the first node. You're going to have some different weight with some different bias. And again, these are some terms. Does that make sense? So every, from every feature to every node, there's going to be some different linear combination of like coefficients that you're going to have to figure out or the neural network will figure out. Okay. So basically, we're dealing with a lot of unknown, not unknowns, but we're dealing with a lot of coefficients that we have to find the optimal values for. So you can sort of separate like, all right, if we just look at this top one, we're going to have to find the optimal like weights and biases going into this layer. Um, if we go to the next one, here is also going to be a different combination of weights and biases. So this is kind of the direction that our different um, inputs are going to. These biases is something like um, intercept in our linear regression. Yep, biases exactly are interest. It's yeah, it works exactly the same as the intercept. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes it choose different weights and biases? <clears throat> is it random, like a random forest, or? Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about it in a little bit, but it's basically gradient descent. Um, it's going to optimize all of the weights and biases at the same time. And I'll talk a bit about how that process works. I'm also going to link out a couple videos that have like much better animations of how that works too. But, um, but yeah, it's, a, it's through like a very intense process of gradient descent that includes like, uh, it's called backpropagation and we'll get into that later, but yeah. How we choose the weights and biases is through a gradient descent like procedure. If overall, like where are we in the like machine learning spectrum? Is this like supervised learning or mm. like what part are we in, I guess? Good question. Uh, the way that this is set up to have a specific output, this would be, I would say this would be a classification problem or a regression problem, but Let's, let's go with classification for now. So that this output is going to generate some number between 0 and M1, and then you just round it down or up. But yeah, let's just assume that we're in a classification problem, similar to a logistic regression. How is it determined how many nodes you have in the hidden layer? Like why that is, is something, cool? yeah, that is something you get to decide. So okay. basically, the less linear you want your decision boundary to look like, or I guess the more intricate you want your decision boundary to look like, you're going to have more nodes in your hidden layer. Got it. Because mm -hmm. you can see with just one um, 
with just one node, I'm just, I'm going to scroll back down, but this example, you end up with a linear boundary. If you have two, you get it, you make it able to have, I don't know, I think with two, you can have like a, for example, like one part of your data goes up one way, another part of your data, it, sl it slants out a different way. And the more nodes you have, basically the more intricate your, um, your decision boundary will become. So yeah, anything else? I understand that this is like just trying to absorb a lot of information at once. So yeah, feel free to um, send over questions throughout the day if you're working on this. Um, but yeah, each node in the hidden layer works like a single perceptron. Each node assigns different weights and biases to every row's inputs. So each node will then transform the inputs and then also passes that through an activation function. So remember how previously we had the sigmoid activation before it comes out to the output. When you're in a hidden layer, oh, let me just align these nicely. There we go. When we're in the hidden layer, each node in your hidden layer will have an activation function. Each node will also have the same activation function. So you get to decide, all right, I want to have a sigmoid activation function for this hidden layer all of these inputs will be transformed to a sigmoid curve before being aggregated again to the output layer. So the activation occurs in the hidden layer as well. The activation just means that you're passing this, like your x1 multiplied by w1 plus b1, put that value through some function to transform it. And then finally, your outputs from the activation functions are aggregated to create an output. Usually this aggregation step, you might have another activation function. Um, typically, if you have a classification problem, and I think I have that below actually, yeah, different activation functions. These are just a bunch of examples. In most cases, ReLU is used just because ReLU, and we'll see tomorrow, the structure of ReLU is actually much simpler to work with. Um, for the output layer, where you also have an activation function, and the purpose of the activation function in the last layer is just to output things in the way that you want them. So for example, you know that a sigmoid will transform whatever number it is to be between zero and one. So you know if you have a binary classification problem, so you can see a sigmoid function for binary classification problem. If you know that you want your output to be between zero and one, you would use a sigmoid activation function at the very, very end. So these are usually all added together, pass it through a sigmoid so that your output will be between zero and one. There's another activation function for um, multi-class problems called the softmax activation function. Basically you imagine binary, but instead you have um, different um, probability ranges for each class and th they will do that automatically for you too. But that we'll talk, uh, more in depth about specific activation functions tomorrow. But at this point, before we get into like how all of these weights are decided, any questions about, again, this structure? Okay, awesome. So how do we decide on these weights and biases? Um, if you remember, if we go back to our um, Logistic regression is done through gradient descent, or more specifically, an, a gradient descent and an MLE, maximum likelihood estimator. So it's again, just trying to fit the best S-shaped curve to your data. So in here, to decide on the weights and biases for every node, not just the hidden layer, for also the output layer, it's this process known as backpropagation. So backpropagation is the process of picking optimal weights for any forward feeding neural network. So what does a forward feeding neural network mean? It just means that the direction in which your data is going is it all goes in one direction. So as a quick example, all of these are forward feeding neural networks because they're all, all the, well, they, these should have errors, but all your data is going from left to right. If you have something like an RNN and just so you know, recurrent neural network, we'll get into it more on Thursday, but an RNN used for time series, it's useful because it's gonna take in your information uh, for future days and then take that into account. So that's why you can sort of see that, you know, these lines that loop back 
um, the data is brought back into the neural network once it has new information. Um, we'll not get into that right now, but just know that forward feeding just means that your data is passing through the neural network in one direction. So backpropagation is a procedure that uses gradient descent to propagate error terms backwards. So what it does is it's going to start with some initial weights. It's going to optimize the layers at the end first and then propagate your error backwards. Um, the math is pretty complicated. It gets into like multivariate calculus. I will send some really good videos. I will say like the um, the inspiration for me to structure the lesson this way did come from a StatQuest video, so I'll send that out as well. Um, but just getting into backpropagation, I will tell you that I spent like hours just like reading and figuring out, all right, how does this calculus work? So um, I think that if you can just say that backpropagation is the process of which you're picking the optimal weights and biases, I think for an entry level, that is good enough. Um, but just being aware that it is propagating errors backwards. And by that, I mean, you're deciding on, you know, you're setting your weights and biases at the end first or at the last layer first and then working backwards. That is, I think, good enough to know for now, but I will send out, um, a couple of videos and a textbook resource for for you all to get into that if you want to. Questions at this point. So in the, at this point, we are optimizing our neural network with uh, gradient descent. Mm -hmm. It is a gradient descent procedure. So um, it is gradient descent you're gonna choose, you're gonna actually initialize weights throughout your entire neural network first, and then gradient descent to make it perform better and better. Mm. Are there any mm, optimizers besides, for example, gradient descent or it's mm -hmm. just? Yeah, this? so there are different optimizers. Um, I have a couple examples on well, on the collab page, we'll talk about a couple of examples, but we will get into different optimizers, not specifically the math of how they work, but different optimizers for different scenarios. So I will talk about those tomorrow. Okay, but okay. yeah, yeah, there are usually some variant on gradient descent. Anything else? In this example, for each time you backprop, is that an additional hidden layer? So like the number of backpropagations you do is how many hidden layers you have? Number of backpropagations you do is, do you mean how many hidden layers or how many nodes in a hidden layer? How many like additional hidden layers? So like, does each time you do a backpropagation create a new hidden layer or does it just update a layer that's already there? It like updates a, a layer that is already there. It updates the weights and biases of the layer that's already there. So we'll see later. What you do first is you tell you tell your the computer how many layers you want in your neural network. Then you do the training. So we'll take a look at that later. But yeah, you basically before you even fit your model, you get to first decide how many layers you want. Um, and today we'll just work with like a single hidden layer. Um, again, different layers are used for different things. For example, like when we get the image classification tomorrow, we'll talk about convolutional layers. Anything else? Um, by doing backpropagation, aren't we going to overfitting our data? Yeah, yeah, we will. <laughs> we will. It tends to overfit your data. Um, Tomorrow we'll talk, we're also going to talk about regularization for neural networks, but, uh, but yeah, not today, but yes, it typically, the more nodes you have in your, um, in your hidden layer or the more layers that you have, it will overfit for sure. Anything else at this point? All right. So just to get a little bit more, not so much as to like how backpropagation works, but how we optimize this gradient descent procedure, um, we talk about this next thing. So neural nets are usually implemented at scale with large data sets. 
therefore optimizing for speed becomes a big concern. So imagine you have like a million data points as training data. It's going to take a very, very long time to run if we use a single training example every time to update the weights and biases. So yeah, what happens as you train a neural network, you're literally feeding it in row by row such that your neural network learns patterns. And so if you have a lot of data points, it's going to take a very, very long time to update weights and biases. So usually you do this in batches. And later when we run our neural network, you'll sort of see what that means. Um, so you have new terminology here. We have batches and then epochs. So in batch gradient descent, which is usually what we use, uh, we're going to pass all of our training examples through the forward propagation stage before using back propagation to compute weights and biases. And a batch is a subset of an epoch. So for example, you can actually choose, let's say you have a million data points. You can set a batch size of 1,000. So it's going to feed in 1,000 at a time, learn all the weights and biases from those 1,000 data points, and then update all the weights and biases, and then move on to the next 1,000 data points. So it's just going to train your neural net and update them in chunks of 1,000. And we'll look at an example later as well. And so once you're done feeding all 1 million of your, of your data points in groups of 1,000, that counts as one epoch. So an epoch is when you're done passing all training examples through the forward propagation. Um, and usually you want to do multiple epochs, right? Because if you just let your neural network see everything one time, um, it might not learn all it needs to learn. Uh, usually, one, you want to also like shuffle around your data points so that it's learning things in different orders. So that's why you usually also have multiple epochs. Um, so batches and epochs are something that you can also tune. Typically, again, um, I think kind of intuitively, the more epochs you have, an epoch, again, the number of times that you pass your data through your neural network as it's fitting, the more epochs you have, the higher tendency you have to overfit. Questions at this point. So just remember, a batch is usually like the subset of your data, and an epoch is the number of times that you run um, all of your training examples through your neural network. So it is possible that uh, we can feed in our data multiple times. Oh yeah, you definitely want, you are going to feed in your data multiple, multiple times. I mean, you don't have to, but usually you do just so one, you can confirm that the weights and biases are better because the learning rate is, I mean, not the learning rate, but the amount of improvement will start to slow down um, as it recognizes the patterns. But, but yeah, yeah, you definitely want to at least have a couple epochs. Again, it also dep depends on your data size and how much time you have to train your, your data. Anything else? Cool. So with um, batches and epochs, there are a couple of ways the gradient descent also works. So different kinds of gradient descent, you have stochastic gradient descent that I feel like is the, um, is the most, I guess you learn the most through stochastic gradient descent because the weights are updated your weights and biases are updated after each observation in the training set. So every one point, you're going to update. Uh, of course, this is not very um, efficient. So you have batch gradient descent. So the error after the error after each example is going to be calculated. So each training point is going to have its own associated error. But the weights are only going to be updated with every batch, at the end of every batch. So difference being the updates that are happening with your weights and biases, of uh, stoch stochastic gradient descent with every point, uh, batch gradient descent every um, after like a bunch of points. So if you set your batch size to be 1,000, it will update your weights after 1,000 uh, data observations. And that's usually aggregated um, over that 1,000 points. Um, typically what is used though is mini batch gradient descent. So it is a compromise between batch and SGD. It splits your training examples into mini batches and then calculates the error and updates your weights after each iteration of the mini batches are done training. So again, 
if your batches are smaller, um, you will be updating your weights more. Uh, if your batches are bigger, there is less updating of weights. Um, it ends up being a, a quicker process. Questions about this? All right, specific optimizers we'll talk about tomorrow as well. Like specific ways that gradient descent works with different optimizers to pick your best weights and biases. All right, now finally, um, when we're feeding node values forward through layers, we're initial, we first initialize, um, ran, you do not, sorry, you initialize your weights with random values and you initialize your biases to be zero. So weights, I mean, usually you don't initialize weights to be zero because all weights will end up being the same anyways. Um, and your bias are usually zero because biases are intercepts. They only really shift your function up or down, if that makes sense. Um, again, I will send out a couple of videos that explain this in like one, a lot longer period of time, but also much clearer. Um, but yeah, you also don't want very large initial weights because that will saturate your activation function values causing, because uh, taking the gradient of the activation function will be hard. Um, yeah, that will make more sense tomorrow. But just know that when you initialize weights, you know how with, um, even with cases like in linear regression, you're not going to initialize all of your weights to be zero because one, it's going to take, sometimes it takes a longer time for it to find the optimal values if you start at zero. Um, but also because each of the nodes is, are going through the same process, you'll end up with every um, weight in your node being the same. If that makes sense. So basically, because you know what we're doing here, if we just like um, isolate each hidden layer, this process is exactly the same as this process for each node in the hidden layer. So if you initialize the same weights for each node, um, it's just going to give you the same thing, like however many times. Like in this case, you'll have the same function four times. It'll just be multiplied by four, so it doesn't make sense. So you want to initialize it with different. Uh, with different weights. And that is done automatically for you when you set up the neural network. Any questions at this point? I will say there is a lot of new terminology. Um, it does take a lot of practice and experience to get used to it. Also watching a lot of videos really helps just because it's uh, again of like the black box nature of it. Um, so yeah, but yeah, any questions before we move into it? implementing our first neural network. All right. So we're going to be using the library Keras. Now, you can also do this in your own Jupyter Notebook. I just wanted to introduce Google Colab to you all. But you can definitely run this in your local Jupyter Notebooks. Um, the fact that we're doing this on Colab is kind of a, a different reason, just in case any of your notebooks kernels die while you're running neural networks. Just know that Colab is an option. Um, Keras is a default choice for beginner deep learners because it's pretty user friendly and easy to implement. We'll see later that each layer is something that you can just define on its own. It's built on TensorFlow. Um, I will say if you all are really interested in neural networks, uh, most people don't use Keras when you're implementing neural networks just because Keras, it is abstracted TensorFlow, meaning it simplifies um, doing it simplifies doing neural networks, basically. Um, if you want to become, get more intricate with like specific function, specific activation functions or um, different cost and loss functions, um, I do recommend after this to look into TensorFlow or PyTorch. So these are the two libraries that most people do build neural networks with. Um, TensorFlow is by Google. PyTorch, I forgot, I forget who PyTorch is by. Is it by Facebook? It's, a, it's also by another big company, but I forget. Um, but yeah, just know that I will link resources to those um, when we get to Capstone. So we'll actually see this in action once I open up the Google Colab. But in building a neural network, you have to first specify your architecture. How many layers do you want? Again, today we're only going to start with one hidden layer. How many nodes in a hidden layer? And also what activation functions do you want to use? Then we're going to compile the model. Compile is not the same as fit. 
comp compiling the model is literally just like saying, all right, this is my architecture. I want to put this together. Um, and then we'll take a look at these details. We'll, we'll see the cost function. We'll see learning rate optimizer and metrics as well. And then you fit your model. And then after this fit step, it works the same as any of your other models that we worked with. We can make predictions. Here are some, um, there is a link to Keras here. This is the Keras documentation, but let's get into Google Colab. Um, so this is Google Colab. Let me know if any of you cannot access this link. I think I've made it public. This works pretty much like a Google Doc. Um, so, so yeah, you can have multiple people collaborate on this as well. Um, and yeah, the thing that I wanted to point out before getting into the code is that now I can connect to a runtime or basically connect to a server. For this, I know I don't need to use too much computing power, but if you want, you know, faster run times, or if your computer just can't handle it on its own, you can actually go into runtime here, change your runtime type, and then actually use a GPU or a TPU. And I believe that these, yeah, these options are free. Um, so you can definitely use these um, if you want, you know, just for it to run faster. Other thing that you can take a look at that might be of interest is to see how much RAM and how much memory you're using in your in your uh, notebook. Um, these numbers don't really mean much to me until they reach the limit. Uh, but if you're aware of like how you calculate RAM or memory, this is here for you. Um, I will say that if you're doing the image processing uh, project, you might want to look into Colab if your computer is, I don't know, if you find that your own computer is a little slow, this might be an option. Um, during one of the office hours, I'll talk about like using your data in Google Colab. Uh, so we won't go through this now. Um, we don't have to go through this now because I'm just going to use a data set from the internet. But some of the things that we are utilizing here, we have a bunch of things from Keras. We're not going to use all of these right now, um, but I'll explain them as we get to them later. And I'm just going to start with this pretty simple data set. You can see that it's actually kind of overkill to be using a neural network for this data set because there's only like 700 rows but a good simple example. So 700 rows and nine columns, same train test flip procedure. Oh, I forgot to ask, any questions about Google Colab? You can see here that it's very much like a notebook. You have your cells. It's a little bit different. You don't, you don't have as many of the keyboard shortcuts, which is why I don't like it as much, but, uh, but yeah, it works the same. You can add your code cells, add your markdown cells, delete like that. It takes a little bit of playing around, but it's easy to get used to. All right, let's get into our neural network. So here I've already done my train test split. I hopefully don't have to explain this uh, again, but models in Keras are defined as a sequence of layers. So as we've seen with all of those diagrams, um, it goes left to right in layers. So here you can see this deep feed forward network has an input layer, two hidden layers, and then an output layer here. That's exactly the, um, I mean, we're not going to do two hidden layers, we're just going to do one, but that's how a model works. So first, you start by instantiating a model. Um, any forward feeding model is a sequential model. So you actually start with sequential. And you can actually see the documentation here if you'd like. And so from this, all you have to do is just start adding your layers. You can see here, I'm adding a dense layer. And basically, the hidden layers that we're going to be using are dense layers. The default layer is a dense layer. So we're going to add a dense layer with 12 nodes. And we also have to tell it that our input dimension is 8. And 8 basically comes from the fact that we have 8 columns of data that we're feeding into our neural network. And then I talked about activation functions. We'll get into more detail tomorrow. But the activation function that we're using here is ReLU. So this is just going to be our one hidden layer. And finally, we need our output layer. So Earlier, I talked about our output layer here, that for binary classification problems, we typically use the sigmoid function because it, um, it limits our output to be between 0 and 1. So because I know that this is a binary problem, we're going to use a sigmoid function. Now, see, this is where we are defining the architecture, and that's pretty much it. After I'm done defining all my layers, here, I'm just doing a compile step. 
compile compile step. Um, loss functions we'll talk about tomorrow too. Optimizers, uh, that's what Ali was asking about earlier. Optimizers, we'll talk about different ones too. Um, if you click onto these, you'll just find a list of all of them. And then here, metrics, I'm going to use accuracy. You can also put in recall, precision. If you actually take a look, actually, let me just open all of these up. In terms of metrics, you can use all of these metrics. You can see you have, where is this? AUC, precision, recall. You can look at all of these. Um, with our optimizers, here, you can see there are all of these different optimizers. Um, and today we're using the Atom optimizer. Then for different loss functions, there's also all of these different loss functions. And today we're going to use binary cross entropy, which is usually for uh, binary classification problems. Um, typically, depending on your problem, you'll look up to see what is typically used uh, in if you're doing like uh, multi-class binary, but usually if you look up, there are some more go-to um, loss functions and optimizers. I know all of these words are very new, so it's normal to feel overwhelmed by this. But let's just quickly run this cell. Um, so our model has been defined in terms of architecture as well as compiled. After this, we can fit. And this is, I guess, kind of the exciting part. So when you do your dot fit, kind of different from same but different um, as with the scikit-learn models that we've worked with so far, we feed in our training data, X and Y, but you also have to give it other things. Number of epochs here, I'm going to do 100 epochs. So basically, it's going to put our data through the neural network 100 times. And because I think in our train set, we have like a good, let's see how many rows our train set is. Chain that shape. Our chain set is 500 rows. Uh, we're going to be passing through um, 50,000 data points into our neural network with 100 epochs. Um, this verbose one two basically defines like how much information is um, is provided here. Usually, I think two is enough. Batch size and this batch size just says again within each epoch how many batches are we going to have. So here we have 514 data points. I've set each batch size to be 100. And you'll actually see, I'll talk about this in a, in a little bit. Um, but here you can actually also incorporate your test data. Um, so here we have our X test and Y test to evaluate. So when I run this step, I think that this part is just fun to watch. But you can see here there's 100 epochs of training. So it starts one at 100 all the way till a hundred out of a hundred here. Um, within this, you can see there's also six out of six. This is the number of batches. So because I have 514 data points and my batch size is 100, um, I have six batches per epoch. Uh, so that's where the six comes from. And then you'll see I have a loss. It's not really a percentage or anything. It's just defined by this binary cross entropy. It's basically like, um, you know, for uh, logistic regression, we define MLE. Actually, no, for linear regression, we define RMSE to be our cost function, loss function in the same way. It's just a different function to determine the overall error. Uh, we also have our accuracy values. Um, this is for the train set, and this is for the test set. It says val for validation. So any questions before I run this cell? All right, so if we run this, I think this part is pretty cool to watch. It like slowly runs everything. You can't really see it doing because it's pretty fast, but yeah, it has just trained our neural network. And then all of these basically come out as each epoch goes. And you can see that um, our validation our accuracy for just our train and our test has gone from like 34 and 35 to um, 64.5 and 67 here. Actually, interesting that the validation accuracy ends up higher than the train, but in this case, black box, who knows what's going on. Um, so with this information, you can see what I did here was I actually saved this to a variable because this dot fit step has a lot of information. One of the information 
one of the pieces of information being like all of these values. And so I'm saving all of this information so I can plot it on a graph. And so saving all of this to history, just for like training history, um, if I scroll down a little bit, I have this matplotlib code over here where I am plotting my training and testing loss. And you can see it has gone down over time as well as my train and test accuracy over time. And over a hundred epochs, you can see that it does go up and down based on, um, I guess the order of training data and the order of batches, but overall getting better with time. Um, because here you can see that it hasn't exactly fully, I guess you could say that this is plateauing, but this has yet to plateau. Um, if I see that this hasn't plateaued, I would usually add more epochs for it to level off. Um, but yeah, that is implementing a neural network. Um, any questions so far? Let's scroll to here. For example, in NLP projects that, for example, we have 10,000 board, our mm -hmm. input dimension would be 10,000. That's right. Yep. So uh, Ali is talking about this part here, the input dimensions. This is the number of columns in your X train. Anything else? When you're working with uh, like the sliding window in NLP, is that an additional input or like how does that come into play? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. I In Keras, I'm not sure, to be honest, because usually if you're training like, you know, the sliding window to create your encoder. Um, it is done using Jensen, which has its own, um, it has its own uh, methods for that. So I'm actually not sure how you would do that in, I've never done it in Keras before, so I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, you would, in the Jensen function, you would define that, that sliding window. Anything else? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. The um, way of differentiating the hidden layer versus the output layer is just the order in which you create them. Yeah, it's literally the order in which you create them. If I wanted, I could add another. Um, I could add another layer here. Um, I forget. I don't think I have to give it an input dimension, but I could add. Yeah, it's literally in in the order uh, of which you you do that. I think this will work. So if you added another one, that would just be another hidden layer. And then the final one would be the output layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Once you get to like multiple layers, which we will tomorrow, um, it's just having your uh, values go through another set of weights and biases before, uh, before aggregating. So you can see here, I just added one more layer um, and the validation accuracy has gone up. It was at 64 earlier and now we're at 72 and 74. So yeah, it could be me adding this extra layer, something else that you could tune at this point that makes sense. Maybe adding more hidden, uh, sorry, more nodes in your hidden stuff, in your hidden layer. Um, but yeah, um, there's also a way to do grid search for, um, for neural networks, but I talk, I'll talk about that tomorrow as well. Any other questions at this point? For this one, since it's binary classification, we have a test set, but since most of them are unsupervised, is like it the best way of seeing how it's doing is just like spot checking, especially I'm thinking more like NLP with like X generation, are you essentially just looking at the output and seeing if it makes sense or not? Honestly, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's in a similar way with any unsupervised problem, right? You can validate it. Uh, there's no like scientific way to validate it unless you can come up with like a proxy for um, validation. I think one thing that people do is you can compare similarities. So in an unsupervised problem, your output wouldn't be a zero one. It would be, again, like some vectors. Um, if you're doing, if you're creating your own word embeddings, for example, um, one really quick, and honestly, recommendation systems work similarly as well. 
if you use like the comparison between vectors as your proxy for like, all right, how accurate or how good my word embeddings are. If you know like two words that are very similar in meaning, they should be close in distance and two words that are opposite in meaning should have maybe a negative vector. Um, not the most efficient way, but it is a way to verify your, um, your embeddings. Anything else? You explain conceptually the difference between adding another layer versus adding more nodes to your current mm -hmm. layer. Mm -hmm. I will say the effect that either adding more nodes or adding more layers, um, the effect that it has on your decision boundary is kind of similar. Um, so I will say that having an extra layer means that it's doing more back propagation having more nodes means doing more things in parallel. Um, to be honest, what a lot of people do is just put a bunch of layers and or different numbers of nodes and just see what happens. Again, just because you know, you're optimizing so many things at once, um, it's hard to say what you would rather do. If time is of concern, usually you just add more nodes, um, but if, you know, if you want to get even more accurate, typically adding another layer will get you there faster than adding more nodes. Um, I don't know if that was, I don't know how helpful that was, but it is hard to say what the exact effect will be. Oh, also it's typical to have more, it's typical to have way more nodes than your number of columns that you have uh, as your input layer. All right, we're just about at time. I don't know if anyone has any like last Musk ask questions. All right, um, I understand that it is kind of overwhelming. I will say that like while I was a student, like neural networks was like way went over my head, but you're able to build neural networks. Like you're able to put layers together. Um, yeah, you're able to put layers together without fully understanding what's going on. Not ideal for right now, but people spend an entire like college semester just focusing on neural networks, whereas we have three days. So definitely like, you know, if a lot of this is not making sense right now, I spent like a, like months just studying neural networks to get to like the level that I'm at, which I feel is not even like, I'm no expert at neural networks for sure. Um, but yeah, just know that it's, you're not gonna fully understand how neural networks work within the next month just because there's so much other things that we've learned so far that might be more applicable to your first job. Well, all right then, um, with that, um, have a good rest of your day, everybody. Um, we have more of this coming in the next two days. Um, again, if you've decided on what topic you would like to work on for your project, feel free to Slack me and let me know. And if, in, if like at least one other person has um, already let me know. I can pair you guys up sooner rather than later so you can start working on the stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll also be sending out a poll tomorrow. Um, actually, no, you know, I'll just do it today anyways, so that if for you all to indicate um, what topic you're interested in. So some of you can maybe get started. All right, then. Um, if there's nothing else, um, I will talk to you all tomorrow. We'll talk more neural networks tomorrow. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.